Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Manager for Dataversity. We want to thank you for joining the latest in the monthly webinar series, Data Architecture Strategies with Donna Burbank. Today, Donna will discuss the rise of the graph database. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, he will be muted during the webinar. And we very much encourage you to chat with us and with each other throughout the webinar. To do so, just click the chat icon in the upper right-hand corner of your screen to activate that feature. For questions, we will be collecting them by the Q&A in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. Or if you'd like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights or questions via Twitter using hashtag DA Strategies. As always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the recording of this session and additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now let me introduce to you our speaker of the series, Donna Burbank. She is a recognized industry expert in information management with over 20 years of experience helping organizations enrich their business opportunities through data and information. She currently is the Managing Director of Global Data Strategies Limited, where she assists organizations around the globe in driving value from their data. She has worked with dozens of Fortune 500 companies worldwide in the Americas, Europe, Asia, and Africa, and speaks regularly at industry conferences. She was just here at Enterprise Data World, and with that, let me give the floor to Donna to get today's webinar started. Hello and welcome. Hello, Shannon. Good to be on these again. Um, so yeah, as Shannon mentioned, um, today's topic is on the rise of the graph database, and uh, we got a lot of interest in this uh, session, and partly because there is a rise <laughs> in interest in graph databases. Um, those of you who have missed, as you know, we have a series, so each month we have a different topic as it relates to data architecture. I often get the question, you know, can we catch the ones we miss? Because I know we always register with the best intents and we have other things come up at work. So yes, they are all on demand. Um, and Shannon generally sends out, if you register, she will send out the link to the on demand, but they are all out on the Data Diversity webinar, uh, on website. Um, and next month will be on best practices and data architecture for the today's rapidly changing landscape, one of which is graph. So just wanted to let folks know that this is part of a series and please do join us in the future. And if you've missed any of the past, you can always catch them on demand. Today we are talking about this rise in popularity of graph databases um, and sort of why some of these key use cases are going for that, the increase in demand. Um, we'll do a basic overview of graph databases. This is not a training in any particular technology, um, but we're all going with the assumption that a lot of you are new to this, um, and it should give you kind of that primer on, you know, what is a graph, why do I need it, and what can it be used for, and some of the business values. We'll also have some industry surveys and kind of showing the rise in this graph database. So just to start off, what is a graph database? Like, great, great way to start. So, you know, at its simplest core, it's a set of basically linking the relationships between data points. Um, so we'll talk a lot more about this, but um, one of the benefits of a graph database is you're really able to see these key relationships from data points and get new insights from your data. So there's sort of a, a balance between the data itself and then also making the relationships between that data a high level relationship. Uh, point in and of itself. And we'll talk more about that if that made no sense because I feel like it just didn't. <laughs> it's one of those days where it doesn't always make sense. But at its, its easiest, we have a lot of things in our head and, and next month we'll talk about it as well of how fast and all the new technology. So I always like sort of a mnemonic in my head of how do I remember graph from key value store from relational to you know, all of the different types. So if you're the type that does that, I like to think of the graph database as thing relates to thing. <laughs> and if you're familiar with kind of the Dr. Seuss cartoons, there are thing one and thing two. Um, but we'll, we'll talk more about that, that sort of line between thing one and thing two are kind of those nodes and edges. Um, so this is kind of the more technical way of that thing relates to thing. So you can call it nodes and edges or vertices and relationships or whatever. Every technology has their slight take on that, but basically it's, thing relates to thing. And the difference, as I mentioned, is that you track the relationships as much as you do the nodes themselves, because that's often where you get the insights of not necessarily the data itself, but how does that data relate to other things. One of the reasons I am a fan of graph databases and other people are and why they can be helpful is that in a lot of ways it mimics sort of how we think. Um, and we'll talk a lot more about this, is that, you know, we sort of have a thought in our head. I'm going to go visit Mary. And then that sort of links to a lot of other things in my head. Oh, Mary has a 
brother John. I wonder how he's doing. Oh, is he still dating Stephanie? And then maybe, oh, I remember John. Yeah, we were young. We crashed a boat. Um, in that boat, we were riding the lake. They still have that house at the lake. And then you think of boats, and then you think of your toy boat. Or if your brain's like mine, then it comes squirrel. <laughs> Random things. Um, just like data. So if that made no sense, sort of where we're trying to head is that there's certain patterns here. You go from Mary to sort of family relationships around Mary to your human relationships, friends and family and human patterns. Um, it might link to activities that happened with those people. It can come into... Um, you know, sort of things and, and objects that relate to those people. So you can kind of group them, and the picture is kind of trying to group an organization. So it isn't just this random thing relates to thing, although my brain sometimes feels that way. But that is the case. Sometimes you will get these squirrel outliers of just this popped into my head for no reason. But in general, yes, there's some linkages, and those things link to things, but there is sort of an overlay of patterns that you can apply to this. But the thing is, just like your brain, you don't really know necessarily where the data is going or in what way you want to look at that data um, in, until it happens or until you actually link those sets together. So what, what do I want to think about with Mary? Is it the people she's related to? Is it the things we've done together? Is it the object she owns? that she has a boat, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So that's, a, in a way, that's sort of how graph databases work at a very, obviously, <laughs> high level. Um, that's a little different from those folks in the relational database world or the way of thinking about the world in more of a sort of a taxonomy or a hierarchy. So I've used this slide in other presentations, but when you think of it, there's sort of a different way of thinking way back, and if you had to memorize this in school, back in 1735, uh, Linnaeus kind of created this hierarchy, and the idea was, you know, if you had to remember, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. <laughs> so you have a, um, a frog that's in a certain genus, you know, it's all of that so trying to organize the world, or a plant can be organized in a certain way. The, the thought back then, and this still has a good place now, is if we could just classify everything, you know, we're smart enough that everything has its place in the world and everything is in an organized bucket and I can order it. In my mind, that's a bit like a relational database where I'm going to define the things I want to order. I want customers and products and um, invoices and I order them a certain way. Um, and if I could just do that, I can understand the whole organization. So there's definitely a place for that. We are still using this hierarchy that they has put together. Um, but it's also a bit naive in the sense that we cannot, the more we learn about the universe, we just know it's sort of, wow, chaotic and thing relates to thing. So it's a bit like um, the organization's data. That some things we can put in a warehouse, and you should organize. If I'm trying to organize species on the planet and do scientific discoveries on it, you know, think of the periodic table of elements. There's a lot of order and there's a lot of structure. But then there's not, <laughs> right? The fancier way. So the more I have kind of a nerd in a lot of things, and I, I can't say I'm a scientist, but I like to read up about things. And the more um, you look at the world, there is this sort of theory of emergence, you know. And so in philosophy or systems theory or science and art, it's the idea that these there's com complex systems, complex patterns, that they sort of result out of very simple uh, interactions. So it's a bit like chaos theory in a way. Things just happen. So we think of a snowflake, and, and without getting uh, religious, or you know, is there one person or god or, or creature that created a snowflake? You, you can't necessarily say that there's a person up in the clouds printing out snowflakes, but there is this snowflakeness. No two snowflakes are the same. They're all very different. There's really no, it's very chaotic but it sort of comes together that there is this snowflakeness. There are patterns that come out to it. There are some p uh, practical applications to this. Um, the picture in the middle, when you, uh, things of when they're doing city planning. Um, you know, I remember in my university, I've told this story before, I know, but you know, they sort of made the, the pathways getting to the different buildings. And they were all nice, or I grew up in New England, so they're all very organized and, and squares, and we're going to make it very you know, clean. But nobody did that. You walked across the lawn because that was the fastest way to go. So often now in, in sort of city design, they will do that. They'll look at traffic patterns or foot traffic patterns, and then they sort of design the cities around that. So again, stuff is happening <laughs> and trying to add that. But that's not, no one designed how a snowflake was going to be built or how the city people are actually going to walk you sort of look at that chaos and emergence comes out of it, these sort of patterns emerge, which in a way is sort of how the brain works. There, yes, there's patterns in my brain that I can't begin to understand, um, but there are patterns that you can put on top of that. And that's a bit like graph uh, theory. 
So in a way, that sort of graph databases can have the best of both worlds, and that there is some sort of uh, random connection. I'm just linking thing to thing, but it isn't chaotic. There are uh, these idea of ontologies or patterns you can put upon it. So I want to look at family relationships um, on this data. I want to look at um, patterns of um, people who Mary has met. So it's a bit of the best of both worlds. It isn't a structured, um, you know, I'm going to design the database and I know how it's structured, but you, it's not just chaos either. Um, and it is all about the relationships. That's one of the sort of characteristics of a graph database that makes them wonderful and makes them unique, um, where a relationship really is a first class construct. You know, kind of ironically, we talk about relational databases, but they're really not about relationships at all. So a friend of mine, Karen Lopez, had a great quote that I have down there at the bottom. You know, a relationship isn't really about relationships, it's about constraints. And when you think of it, if you look on the right, if you're a relational data model, that'll look familiar to you. It's basically about keys and foreign keys and basically creating the, con they are great for what relational databases um, do. They're, they're right. I want to have, um, I want to have data quality. I want to have referential integrity. I'm building an accounting system and I want to make sure all the accounts link to that customer correctly. You really actually are creating constraints. I don't want data put willy-nilly. I want to make sure that this customer correctly links to this account. That's kind of that kingdom phylum class order. I am creating a construct, a construct and a structure on top of it for a very good reason. It's not going away. Relational databases are wonderful. I'm a big fan. But it's a different use case to try to discover patterns and relationships, which you can do in a relational database. A lot of the use cases, when we go through use cases in graph, you might say, Cynically, oh, we can do that in relation. Well, you can. You can do a lot of things with a lot of different things, but the power of graph is in these relationships. You have these sort of key, uh, these, these uh, you know, thing relates to thing. Customer is the owner of an account on the left. That's more of a graph database data model, whereas on the right is your more traditional uh, relational database. So there's this isn't one way to ma model graph databases. This is not necessarily particularly talking about the pros and cons of different ones. I'll just kind of say generic. So um, two that are out there, you have the RDF, which is kind of the triples. Um, and some of the sample query language of that would be Sparkle. Um, one of the vendors that supports that is Stardog. They spoke last year on this topic. Um, there's also kind of the labeled property graph, which I think that might be Neo4j with different, you know, but they have different ways of doing it, but they're basically without getting details into each one of these, there's plenty of, of actually the vendors themselves, if you are trying to learn graph, um, actually have some very good training out there, um, obviously particularly around their um, solution, um, but there's actually some great materials out there, so I don't want to necessarily redo that, um, but want to kind of point out the other thing is there's sort of a nice close affinity between logical and physical if you think of relational, which there's also a link between logical and physical, but you sort of have the logical design that matches the business, and then you may change that drastically when you actually go to the physical database for performance or whatever, um, be because uh, the graph kind of does mimic the way the data is and the way the world works, um, there's less of a, you know, there's more of a connect between that kind of logical and physical model. Um, again, you have this idea of an ontology that can help define these queries. So again, you could have just thing relates to thing, that's just random. But I might say, you know, something like, well, people have names and, and people can own kinds of things and pets can be owned and, and a dog is a pet and dogs also have names, but a dog is clearly different than a person. So it's kind of these basically logical constructs and you might want to write a, write a query, show me all the people who own dogs, right? So there's sort of a link between that. Um, and uh, someone wrote, this is kind of like the conceptual model where triplet, you know, subject, predicate, object, yes, it's actually very similar to that, very similar comp on construct, um, and it's also dynamic. So you might say, I want to show all the people who own dogs, you know, so thing relates to thing. You could also say, show me all the people who have been bitten by dogs, show me all the people who love dogs, some of the people who, you know, again, there's different relationships in that data, and that's where some of these ontologies or how I want to look at the data uh, can come into play. So we sort of knit, we called this series, uh, this webinar, the rise of the data, graph database. What does that mean? Who's actually using this? Is this nice theoretical? Is it actually being used? What do you think? So um, I, I've called out this uh, this trend paper that we've done, Dataversity and I and, and my colleague Charles Rowe at Dataversity, 
um, and I put this together late last year, the kind of trends in data architecture in general, and one of the questions was who actually today is using a graph database? You know, we talk about it, we hear about it, um, and so still a fairly small percentage, about 12.7 percent, a little under 13 percent, are currently using a graph database. So when you compare that to relational databases at the bottom there, whether they're in the cloud or on-prem, they're still clearly the leader, and unfortunately the ubiquitous spreadsheet is still out there, you want to call that a database. So, you know, we still do have some of those other systems, but I will say in the comments, in that paper, we'll show a link at the end, there's a lot of um, uh, inf more information in that paper beyond what we can show in this webinar. Most, many, many comments were people investigating graph, talking about graph, um, looking to explore graph. So if you looked at rather the, the qualitative, not the quantitative, there was a lot of interest in graph. So the other flash of this is, you know, what am I using today? So it could be that I, I'm using relational and I hate relational and I want to go to something else, right? Um, I'm not saying that's the case, it's just an example. So we did ask the question, who's using it in the future? And you'll see that that's a lot higher, um, more 22.6% um, of folks are looking or planning actually, not just looking to, but actually planning on implementing graph databases. And that's a big jump. To be fair, and I, I find this uh, graph itself very interesting, so when you look at the one before, what are people using today? It's the big players, unfortunately, spreadsheets and relational databases, some XML, JSON, that kind of thing. Um, and those just jump out as being huge um, leaders. When you look at what people are looking at in the future, it's a lot more um, kind of even, evenly spread, which I think so makes a lot of sense. You know, in the past, we just didn't have as many tools that we do today. And I, you know, you've probably heard me vent about this if you've heard me speak, right? Of, of I'm, I'm a, I get upset when vendors are saying crazy things like, you know, relational databases are going away and it's all going to be big data. Or we don't need uh, big data. We're all going to use NoSQL. We're not going to use, you know, it, it's what horses for courses, I guess, is that one of the, you know, the beauty of the environment right now in data architecture is that we do have so many choices. And depending on your use case, there's a lot more technology that can more act. We don't have to put everything in, in a relational database and make it try to fit your use case. I am using um, real-time streeting data. I, maybe I want to put that on the big um, Internet of Things data, put that out on a S3 bucket or a big, big data platform, right? So um, the fact that this is 22% is actually a higher percentage in a way because it isn't as... Um, all, all or nothing, if that made any sense. Um, you will see a leader here is big data. A lot of people are looking at that, but that is not e exclusive. These are check all that apply. Another thing I thought was interesting is just a, a thought. Um, as we were looking, I, I always love to look at the past and what people said were going to be the predictions and were we right. <laughs> um, so um, it was back several years ago, Forrester has predicted that graph databases would have about a 25% adoption rate by 2017. So um, they didn't quite get it, according to this particular survey we did, and the fact that if you looked at 2017, which is when we did the survey, it was about 12.7, but they're about right if you were looking at what people are actually actively planning to do. So that's actually pretty close. I just find that sort of interesting to see, you know, we, we predicted something how close are right. So go far, sir, you weren't too far off. Um, um, just to be equal across the uh, different... Uh, Analysts, as I have no favorite or an unfavorite. Um, if you're familiar with Gartner's sort of hype cycle, you know we sort of labeled this, you know, the the, the rise of the um, graph database. Is it rising? Is it falling? Who, who knows? So if you're familiar with, they sort of have sort of a, a cynical view of the world, perhaps. <laughs> um, but the the you know we're trying to have the are we at peak expectations? Are we in the trough of disillusionment? <laughs> what a great phrase. Are we in the slope of enlightenment? Um, so where are we? Are, are we, you know, totally overplaying the value of graphs? So we're not there. Um, but I think what they're kind of think their, their call is, well, we're a little bit inflated expectations on what graph databases can do. We're not yet disillusioned. Hopefully we can skip the disillusionment phase and go into enlightenment. The, I think the cynicism of this whole idea of this graph is similar to what I was just sort of venting about, in that we, we have this new technology and then we say, oh my gosh, it's going to boil water and also be a floor cleaner. You know, it, it is what it is and it's very good at what it does. And hopefully webinars like these help clarify what these things are good for, what they could be interesting about, but they're not going to solve world peace. Um, 
and they can just do certain things. So um, I, I would probably agree with Gartner's take there. I, I think people are using it. There's some interest um, in them a little bit into past the peak of thinking it's, you know, the best thing since sliced bread, but it is awful, awfully interesting and a lot of interesting things to think about it. So what I'd like to do next is get your opinion. So we have 185 people currently on this webinar. I want to hear what you think. So we've got a few surveys, and I'm going to pass it over to Shannon um, to ask her to do similar questions to we just saw in the industry. So Shannon, if we can line up this first survey. And we have a bit of a, a challenge. So I don't know if you heard us before you joined. Shannon was cynical, and she thinks you're not going to answer these surveys because you're multitasking and not listening to me. So stop multitasking. And I'm going to ask you, on the right, you'll see a little poll question. Are you currently using a graph database in your organization? So hit the yes or no, and then you'll need to hit submit at the bottom. And we have a time limit. Um, so we have about 17 seconds left. Uh, and then once everybody is submitted, we'll get to see the answers. And I'll just be curious, are we going to be more like the 17% adoption that was in the survey, or are we going to be more close to the forest's 25%, or are you going to match uh, Shannon's cynicism and nobody's t listening to me and you're all uh, multitasking on a spreadsheet somewhere? Um, so we'll give it a minute for the polls to come through. This is where we play the music. The, uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. All right. So, oh, 144% of you actually proved Shannon right, but most of you did answer, so that's good. So, um, we will see here that the majority of folks are not using a relational database. Uh, my math is not good enough to put that in the percentage. Anyone in the polls who's better at math than me on the fly can see what that percentage is, <laughs> folks. Um, so that's about right from my gut feel. It's probably, you know, if you look at the little line, I, I think most folks are not using it today, but there is a certain percentage um, that are. So that's good. Probably about the same as our initial survey from my gut of what that number is. So Shannon, if we can line up the next one, the next question is going to be, drum roll please, um, are you looking to do um, a, a graph database in the future? So yes, it's of interest to me. I've been playing around with the technology. Um, you know, whether you have approved budget or is it of a high interest, but we'll put both of those in the same category. So I'm going to ask folks who is, is this could be that you're using one today and you're all going to continue using it. So those who answered yes can also answer yes to this one, um, just so that we get an accurate number and we're, we're clear on what that says. So we'll give that a minute. And we'll see. I'll be curious. The poll has ended, and I think we will see the results soon. I don't understand if we have to show it or if it just comes. I think you said it just came. All right. All right. So that's probably around in line as well, um, that there's a good percentage of folks kind of looking for it, probably a little higher from my limited math skills. Um, than what was on the R survey at Data Diversity and the Forrester survey. Um, probably not too uh, surprising given the topic of this <laughs> webinar, which is on the future of graph databases. So probably some interest there. So Shannon, let's let, uh, load up the last question, um, which will be sort of a good segue into the next section that we'll be talking about, um, which is use cases. So this is one of those select all that apply. And we haven't really talked about them, but um, I'll be curious. What are people sort of looking at uh, using graph databases for? Um, if any of these kind of, um, and if you're not using it, just say, I'm not, uh, just so we'll have an answer. Um, and then let us know what you think, Wh which one of these, or if I missed one that you're looking for, I'd be curious. Um, that would be the other. So we'll hit submit, and I'm really curious about this one because it kind of you know, shows the why, not just the weather. Um, of what people are doing. We will give it a moment. I need some Jeopardy theme music, Donna. I was going to sing it, but if you've ever heard <laughs> it, I didn't want to punish people. They'll never come back to the webinar. 
people are uh, it'll be worth it. I'm just curious, you know, when people never get a voice on these things. And we don't want to just hear what the <laughs> the industry pundit said. We want to hear it. So There you go. All right. So drum roll please. Um, a lot of folks didn't answer or they're not using. So those which is fine. That's sort of probably why you're joining this to kind of learn more. So I think you'll see here kind of the ones that are. It's either master data management enterprise knowledge graph um, and metadata management, which is interesting. So um, a few kind of things like social networks, fraud detection, um, and you space, I'll see your own answers there if you did. So, all right, that's good. So the next section, this is a perfect segue into um, the next, oh, I actually, before we go, so someone put other, five people put other. Anyone in the chat um, want to put what they did as other? Um, I'd be curious what, which ones we sort of missed. Some people said they were interested in what this idea of enterprise knowledge graph, um, and we definitely will be talking about that. But anyone want to put out what the ones we missed? If not, and you're shy, that's fine. I won't belabor this point. Um, okay, so um, I'm going to move on just to, I thought that was a good segue. Some of you might have been curious about some of those topics or how that even fits. Oh, someone put that they put oper use their operational data for graph databases. That's interesting. Um, yeah. So, um, all right, so we'll go through some of these use cases for graph databases, why this technology could be cool in your organization. And one of the bigger ones um, is this idea of social networks. So when you think about relationships, almost the classic relationship is social relationships. So again, you may have a group of individuals, and the in you know, people individually are interesting. Hopefully Donna is an interesting person, but what can be more interesting is who Donna hangs out with, right? And who she doesn't hang out with. So you go, this is used often for things like uh, terrorist groups. It could be used for things like grouping your customers by like customers of who you might want to sell through. Um, and in this case, we want to hear who the cool kids are. So the cool kids are the ones that hang out with Donna, of course. Um, and the people who don't, those who don't like data up in the group, up in the right, you'll see they don't really have many friends because it is cool. Um, and the people in the middle, really, at this point, we don't know. It doesn't mean they're not interesting, but remember with graph, you can sort of ask the question. They're not interesting in this particular um, uh, this particular use case. Um, actually, one of the folks that said the other use case, but it was classified, sorry, we can't share. This may have something to do with this type of use case. There's a lot of kind of intel with patterns of people. Uh, metadata was big in the news a while back with people using uh, phone logs, right? And so, you know, people would say, why would metadata be interesting? Well, it's not what I may said on the call, or it might be, it might be who I called, right? And someone blew up a building and I made five calls to that person. That's kind of the, the link between that person and the metadata about it. So again, it's making the relationship itself kind of that interest. So. This is a large, um, great, great use case, and we're trying to kind of query that back. Um, great use for a graph database. Uh, kind of a fun example if you want to be nerdy, but if, and maybe we're dating our, my age. But um, there's this idea of, you know, degrees of sec separation. You know, one of them is what's your, um, this is a thing, right? You're, if everyone and was familiar with the actor Kevin Bacon, you know, what's your Bacon number? Or basically, how many degrees of separation, if you named anyone on the planet, you have. It's basically the idea of relationships between two people. There actually is a, a Bacon <laughs> number um, generator on, on a website. So I just picked randomly an actress, right? So Audrey Hepburn um, has a Bacon number of three. So it will say what movies they may have been in and then actors or actresses that were in other movies to link. Um, and um, but there's also an idea of, of quality, right? Which Audrey Hepburn? Right, so there's a Audrey Hepburn with with bacon number of three, and there's also one of two. Could it be a different Audrey Hepburn? Right, so uh, uh, graph databases are cool. You can see patterns, but just like anything, the data itself has to be correct and interesting, or you'll get funny numbers. So, but this is a huge, big um, use case for graph databases, and can have that was sort of a, a fun result. So it isn't just people um, that we want to see relationship to. Another use case is sort of fraud detection. So again, you're looking at patterns between data and between data elements. And that's where these graph patterns can really have some good um, interest. So one of them might be an example of maybe it's credit card usage, right? So if I have a certain IP address, you would think 
that from my ad IP address, I'm going to buy books on data management online, and I would tend to use the same credit card from my computer. Well, maybe I have a work business card and a personal business card, and okay, that's fine. Or maybe my family shares my computer, and they all have their own credit cards, so there's like two or maybe three. But when you start to see one IP address with what are there, seven different credit cards coming from it, that seems fishy, right? Did I just steal a bunch of credit cards and I'm just now buying all data management books? Because, of course, that's what people would buy when you steal a credit card. Um, and so that's just, again, I don't know who IP is. I don't know what transactions they're doing. I don't particularly care at this moment. It's not the data itself. It's the patterns in the data and some of that, uh, you know, the relationships between them. So, again, that's another example where it's the relationships between the data um, that are interesting, not necessarily the data itself. That said, once I find out that this is fraud, I probably do care who and what IP address one is and what it is they purchased and all that kind of thing. So it's not one or the other, um, but this is just a nice way to see those patterns. Um, another common use case is this idea of a recommendation engine. So we've all seen that. Like this, purchase this, right? So when you, again, that's just patterns when you compare of these online organizations that can do that have a huge data set of uh, customer interactions and can kind of base patterns. So if you look at customer three there in the green and the left, they bought product two um, twice. They really liked it. Um, and I'm customer one, and I brought product one, and customer three also brought product one, if that made any sense at all. So let me bring out my handy-dandy little uh, pen. So, okay, I, I'm customer one, I brought product one, right? Customer three also bought product one. But look, customer three also really likes this product too, right? So that's where their recommendation says, based on your relationship with customer three who bought the same product, you might also like product two, right? So that's one very simplistic way of showing that. But again, it's the, it's the relationships between people and the relationships between buying patterns um, of other customers. Again, back to the theme of this insight and these findings are only as good as the data itself. It's not only the quality of the data. If I really didn't buy this product, then, then the whole thing is moot, right? But also the volume of the data. These patterns are only interesting when you have enough data. Just like any survey, if you only survey two people, it's not of this value as if you surveyed thousands of people, you get a better result, right? So I am a big old nerd, and I actually was giving um, a presentation on how to use data for <clears throat> other than EW. I think I've said this before. It's my favorite conference I ever went to. It was the European Outdoor Sporting Goods uh, Society, and uh, they wanted to know how, how they can use data better for selling more outdoor products. And I'm a big outdoor enthusiast, so that was a lot of fun. So I wanted to pick an example that had to do with how I might buy an outdoor product online and, and show this example. So I, I sort of had a camping ax there on the left, if you're wondering. So I went into one of the big search engines, and I said, you know, I want to check out the price of this. What came up was, if you like this ax, you'll also like these coffee filters. And to me, that just seemed really weird. Like, you know, I, I get I bought a book on data management. There's another book by a similar author on data management. That makes sense to me. But, yeah, you bought an ax, you'd also like coffee filters. It seems to make no sense. It does make sense in the sense that they probably had very few people. This isn't the most popular um, product, perhaps, but there's some guy up in Canada that was going camping, and those type of coffee filters are actually often are the ones for the coffee pots you use when you're camping. So this person probably bought their axe and they're camping, and they probably also bought a tent and some other things. So it's not that this was wrong. It's just there was such a small data set, it just seemed kind of weird. It's not like there were other types of axe or an axe cleaner or an axe whatever. The other funny thing, which is a little beyond the scope of this, is that we're also familiar with content targeting, right? So you look at something once on the Internet and it follows you around for weeks. So, so for weeks I sort of had this axe coming up and showing I'm looking for something online and the axe is following me. It was sort of like a bad horror movie. <laughs> I should probably should have picked a better example. But again, um, it's a cool technology, but only as good as the data itself that you have. And that's why some of these big online vendors are actually good at this because they just have so many customers to take the answers from. Okay, so another um, use case is, and I'm going to do a comparison here, is this idea of the enterprise knowledge graph, and that there's other ways to call it. Some vendors have kind of come up with this, or I've heard this a lot, but it's not the call it whatever you want. Um, 
We're trying to get information about all the data across the organization. One way on the left, and it's a very valid way, we're building one now in a customer of mine, and it's fine, um, is the idea of a data warehouse. I want to know in my warehouse, this is kind of that, um, um, the, what do you call it, the taxonomy, the kingdom, phylum, class order, family, genus, species, or the periodic table of elements. I'm adding a structure onto the data. So I have all this data across the organization. I know that I want to have total sales by region, by customer, by month. And if you're familiar with this, you, know, you need to create a, there was a model about how customers are stored. I want to create a dimensional model to say read sales by month. And then I create a nice report. And it, that's valuable, it's wonderful, but it's very structured and you should have know the answer. Another way to do it is this idea of a knowledge graph. Maybe I just want to know who my influential customers are. And that might be I have the most connections. You know, those are the example I showed before. Or I just want to see linkages between my data. That there's a link between customers and regions, but it's not that structured. It really is just that thing relates to thing. And in many ways, this can be equally or more valuable. It, not everything has the structure of I just want to say report by or have these strong linkages. It's just linking the different things across my organization in a more fluid way and, and seeing the more relationships between them and getting fast performance back from it. Um, so one example of sort of a thought of that. So I coming back to uh, Audrey Hepburn, right? So your data quality, I'll keep saying that, of, of semantics, those are very important. You want to get that right. So I have Audrey Hepburn. I want to know that her birthday was a certain date, that whether she's a custom, current customer. Super interesting, right? But it may be more interesting. Um, I don't know if anyone's a movie fan. I'm not particularly not. I just used this as an example. Uh, Audrey Hepburn had a son uh, named Luca Dotti, and he was born in 1970. Um, so she's the he's actually a current customer and he actually because he's really wealthy because his mother was a famous actress um he has yacht insurance from you he has home insurance he's filed a claim there's all this great information about the relationship so it could be do, do you know that some of your customers are related and maybe um i have a three people who work at the same company who have a certain corporate insurance with this so it's the relationships between the data patterns can also be much more interesting than the data itself. So it's interesting that we have this information about a customer, but the fact that she's related to this other customer that actually has bought a lot of stuff and is very wealthy is probably a lot of interest to us. So sometimes it's that pattern across it. Um, another use case is this idea of master data management. So there's a lot of MDM tools on the market that are powered by a graph database behind them rather than a relational database. Um, and, and that can work well. Often that can be sort of a virtualized way of doing it, linking thing to thing, the data which stays where it is. Um, that can be very, when you're thinking of more of that knowledge graph approach, that can be a very interesting way to do your, your master data management because you can link your master data to thing to thing to thing. So that can be sort of nice. Um, I will say though that you know, as you look at tools, both of these approaches doesn't obviate the need that you still need all some of the hard stuff of MDM. You still need data quality. You still need to uh, do the matching, the meaning behind it, the um, survivorship and all of that stuff are sort of similar between both. I mean, you still need to know, is this the same Audrey Hepburn that was born in 1929 or Audrey Hepburn, my neighbor, who's born, you know, 10 years ago and lives next door. Right, so that part doesn't go away whether you store it in an MDM or a graph because that those just, I mean, or MDM, say it again, graph or relational because that's just sort of how you link things together. Um, another use case of graph, um, folks might have heard of the semantic web and the city of RV, RDF triples. I think someone had some, some real comment and some of the comments. Um, the idea behind this, if you're familiar with the internet, in a way, that's a thing relates to thing. At its core, the internet is just computer linked to computer and different IP addresses, right? But the goal of this whole semantic web was to move from a web of documents, which is the internet, just thing relates to thing in terms of machine, to a web of data, that thing relates to thing in terms of data. So you still have this subject predicate object, but you could say that this Acme Publishing is a publisher of a certain book, RDF is easy, um, et cetera. So this is very similar in this idea of thing relates to thing with a certain syntax. There are sort of schemas and vocabularies for certain areas. You can look up a few, um, Dublin Core, schema.org, um, to kind of have some of these uh, schemas on, you know, how do I relate a publisher with books, for example. 
Um, example I've used, given that it is Enterprise Data World Week, this is EDW from a couple years ago, but still in the current location, which is San Diego, which is beautiful. Um, here's an example of kind of a use case of that, which again, instead of a web of documents, which is the internet, you have a web of data. So I could be, uh, if you look at this as an old Enterprise Data World uh, web page, and this is the, the web page text behind it, we can sort of tag that with the fact that this is a place. So Enterprise Data World was at a place, which happened to be Sarah in San Diego in San Diego. That year I took a picture, don't judge my skills, I'm not the best photographer, um, but I could have tagged that with the same idea that this place was in Sarah. And so if I want to know all the things around this place, is sort of doing that through this idea of these kind of triples and you can link the data together. Okay, so in summary, um, the idea, the very simplistic, given that there's a lot of technology and you want to sort of get your brain around graph, one of the simplest ways to think about it is this idea of a thing relates to thing. Your relationships are first class contracts and they're as important as the data itself. We are seeing that usage of databases, graph databases are on the rise. I think your feedback was as similar to what the, our, our survey and some of the analyst surveys um, were about the same. People are just starting to look at this and adoption is on the rise. As with any technology, there is a risk of inflated expectations. Pick some of the use cases we mentioned that are good. I wouldn't necessarily, um, someone there is saying they're using it for operational, but there is also a very good use case for some of these relational databases that we have been using or H, uh, you know, XML for data transfer and things like that. You know, there's, there's certain use cases for each one. Um, I think I've mentioned this before, this is my company, we do it for a living. Um, there, if you wanted more about other trends in data architecture, you can download the, this white paper we did put together. Um, it does show the graph data uh, questions we had. And then also a reminder, um, if you wanted to join us next month, we'll be talking about more just broadly data architecture best practices with some of a lot of those technologies that were in that survey. Um, so without further ado, I wanted to open it up for Q&A. Uh, I know there's been some comment, um, but I know I have not been keeping track of all the questions. So Shannon, if you wanted to open it up for questions. Yes, we have a lot of great questions coming in already. And just to answer the most commonly asked questions, just a reminder, I will be sending a follow-up email by end of day Monday for this uh, webinar with links to the slides and links to the recording of the presentation. So Donna, diving right in here. Um, so this sounds like a conceptual model. This is from the beginning of the um, presentation. It sounds like a conceptual model where uh, tiplets are used to um, subject, predicate, object, yes? Yes, and I think I, I sort of touched on that, but um, it also relates back to the comment I made. It is sort of a conceptual model, but the beauty is it's not so far away from the actual logical model. I mean, physical model, sorry, because you actually are kind of linking a thing with a thing with a layer. Um, so it, it's sort of a nice layer you put upon the actual physical data. So, yes. So what are the, uh, the big differences between a graph and a relational database? Um, yeah, let me, I think we covered that. Let me go back to um, that slide. I think we, we covered it, but just in case. Um, so this is probably a good summary. We're on the right. You have a relational database. And you have things like keys and attributes and sort of defined linkages, which are really constraints, right? So I have a customer ID. I want to link this customer ID to this particular account. You've designed the schema up front, um, and it's as much about the kind of, you know, the keys and the, and the traversal mechanisms between. Um, I think a lot of folks understand relational, so I won't go so deep there. But here, it really is more of these triples, um, although there, you know there are triples, and we all learn that with relational. Um, but it, part of it is we do make the relationship itself a first order construct, and it's more about I have a customer linking to account, um, and it really is those triples where the relationship itself is the sort of layer you can add on top with your your sort of uh, ontology to really understand how this data links together. So I think this question is a bit rhetorical, but um, let me just throw it at you. Uh, the CIA perhaps is using social network graph notation to identify relationships around a single person of interest. Is that true? Can you speculate on that? Yeah, I won't speculate on particular uh, agencies or whatever, um, but yes, that is a usage <laughs> that I think I covered sort of here. 
Um, it could be a social networking site of, you know, I, I want to see who my friends are. It could be a gaming application, and I want to see who has similar gaming patterns to me. And, it, you know, it isn't always a nefarious use. It could be someone's making phone calls to some people, and that person just did something bad, you know, that sort of thing. So, yes, for both good or bad, you can also use this for customer um, profiling. I have this customer that buys a lot, and I have these other customers that this person interacts with. Maybe we should target market with them or whatever. So, yeah, for good or bad, this is almost a prime use case of, of kind of thing relates to thing or person relates to person. Oops, sorry, having issues with a mute button. Um, <laughs> <laughs> All right, so the use of the total borrower exposure calculation is based on the relationships of a single individual when he or she wants to borrow money. I believe um, that's another statement if you want to comment on it. Um, I'm not sure I follow that. I might have to read that one. Um, a total borrower equation is, and I can't even read my own. Um, I, I would, <laughs> yeah. Um, total borrower would. Yeah, I, uh, I'm not following. Um, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm not following that one. But that's okay. Again, no. I so I, yeah, yeah. I do believe it's more of a statement, but maybe if the questioner can can clarify, but. Uh, I'll get back to that. So well, um, I'll just say well, one quick comment yeah. on that, just in case I'm, I mean, often you can find, I mean, it could be that um, you can, you, you could find out, say, the credit score of that person. You can see who that person is related to. Sometimes the total borrowing could be that there's other activity, you know, with that, what activity is that person doing? So it's not just the transaction you saw with that person. It could be linked transactions. You know, they have loans at other places. Um, so. Uh, that was sort of my comment on that. They may have been trying to thinking of that. So. And uh, this questioner just said, hey, can you throw up uh, page 22 again? They lost their screen for a moment. So um, while I go on to the next question, if you wouldn't mind. Awesome. Hey, Peter. Um, <laughs> um, so what tools exist to support GDPR right to be forgotten to remove information from graph databases that include PEII about uh, European citizens. Oh, there's a good one. Um, so yeah, I mean, this is a good use case for um, kind of detecting that because you can definitely see patterns. You can see links between. Um, as with anything, the deletion can can be. You know, one of the use cases that we mentioned, um, and I was pleased to see that several people on the call were, is this idea of metadata management because that's sort of the linkage. Um, where you can see that this, you know, that almost is your classic lineage, that this person was linked to this and all these different transactions. When you get into the deletion, that's where things get tricky. Um, I think that is a harder question. I think that's what great, great use of the relational database <laughs> in that, um, you know, you can kind of do some of those cascade deletes. Um, but yeah, delete is always, it's a great way to detect and, and then delete, deletion will have the same issues that you would have deletion with anything. It doesn't magically unbreak things <laughs> that may have been linked. So that that's part of the problem. Even with GDPR, is it a true deletion? Is it, you know, I was working with one customer and there's also conflicting rules. You know, it may be you need to delete this, but if there is ever a police record of this information, it needs to be kept somewhere. So delete isn't always delete. Sometimes it's delete store off site so only certain people have access but you know because you know don't just delete me and I can't see it in the website but you know so you know deletion is always a hard part but it can certainly help with detection. So when developing a graph database relationships um, your depiction of representation of one person may be different uh, relationship from another person's representation so how do you deal with that? Um, I think that's partly where some of these ontologies come in. So the the person itself, you know, there's st the the thing is still defined as the thing. Um, sometimes it's this overlay. If you go back to that example of, you know, is the relationship? What are we looking at? How do we want to add that ontology? Is it a, a person loves a dog or owns a dog? Um, so it's, it's less about how you define that thing, where you still certain have attributes and information on that thing. Um, a lot of it is that relationship and how you want to add that overlay or the linkage between that. So. 
So when would I use a triple star versus a labeled property graph? Oh, gosh. Uh, <laughs> that, that's almost a, a religion. Um, so this kind of gets back to that. I think everyone, I would say, like, from my experience, I would say the sort of labeled property graph in many has been sort of the more popular and the easier to look at um, and easier to use, but that's, you know, everyone has their own. I think in the last, we did a, one last year, I sort of went on the RDF, partly because there's some of the industry bodies use that. Um, you notice the semantic web sort of use that as well. Um, so I will leave that to your preference as some of it. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I would say in terms of what I see in terms of usage, um, it seems to be more towards that label property graph. Anything else, Shannon, or are we kind of... Oh, yeah, so here, I'm just talking to the mute button again. Um, you know, <laughs> so if we've got a lot of great questions coming in, Saldana. So how well um, do graph um, databases scale horizontally? Um, I'm not sure what they mean by that question. Maybe they could put more context in that of a use case of what they're, what they're asking. Yeah, so maybe if the questioner could um, throw something in there to, to uh, help explain, I will look for that and come back to that. Uh, so what modeling tools are used for graph database design? Also, how do you operationalize this? Um, so often, the sometimes it is a text-based uh, kind of layer on top of it. Some of the tools themselves have um, their own kind of UI to do this. Um, and so operational is fairly, I wouldn't be scared of it. I think this is a fairly, you know, especially with some of these tools that have been on the market, they make it easier. Some some are more code-ish based than I would like. Um, so I, I think partly because these are new, I would think a, a good way for the industry to improve, like just think of relational databases, right? Since we're all, many of us are familiar with that. In the old days, you had to code, you know, DDL and kind of co code the information um, both from the, you know, things like data modeling tools like Erwin and ER Studio and those sort of things can do a lot of that graphically, as well as some of the querying tools are now more graphical. I think graph, so graph is a little bit behind. I, I think Stardog is one. I think they're very text-based, um, but some of the others are, have a bit better user interfaces, but it's still probably more texty than I, I would like. And partly it's just adoption. Things get easier. You know, think of SQL. It was always written, and now there's a lot of great tools that can do joins for you and things like that. So. An evolution. Well, thank you. So I'm waiting for a uh, couple of clarifications, but a uh, big part of DWH is sourcing the data that eats uh, the ETL. When using graph databases for analysis, surely you'll need something similar? Uh, I need to read these because I... Uh, so sorry, big part of uh, data warehousing is, is sourcing oh. the data, right? So the ETL. So when using graph databases for analysis, surely you need something similar to that. Yeah, you do, although it's a bit of a different paradigm, at least in the use cases that I mentioned. Um, so let's go back to one of those pictures where we sort of had this idea of, you know, part of what you're doing in ETL is uh, really making that transformation. So I want this in a certain format. You know, in the, in the sense that some of what you're doing is data cleansing in, in a warehouse, which hopefully you don't have to because eventually your source systems will be great, then then yes. Um, but here, you know, you're actually trying to translate it, put it in a certain for, structured format before you report. With some of these, you know, the graph layer, a lot of it can be, especially say we're looking at some of this, you know, social network pattern analysis. I'm not defining the link between that as closely. So it's a bit of a loose link. It really is more of a thing relates to thing versus I'm taking field X, transforming it a certain way, plopping it into field Y with this particular lineage transform. It's more just links between, which is kind of, it can be a pro and con um, because this is sort of the, the flexibility of this is sort of the beauty of it. So again, you can use a lot of things for a lot of things. The beauty of this is, is I would think if you're going ETL, so the ETL and relational database tools are are fine. I think when you're trying to do those more loose connections or, or just more flexible and dynamic connections, that's where the graphs can come in nicely. So what strategies do you use to populate a graph database? 
um, it sort of depends on how they're being used. I'm going to use it for an operational, so I guess the, the range of um, population is, you know, is sometimes it's a, putting a graph on top of existing data, um, maybe. Um, so it really sort of depends on how you're using it, but, you know, whether it's sitting on an operational store or you're putting, you know, your data into a graph to do the analysis, which is a lot of the use cases I'm using are sort of some of that post-processing where you're just saying, you know, this data for the social network existed. I'm porting that into the, you know, the graph and then doing the analysis on that, which is very different than I'm actually, you know, typing this into a graph, which I probably wouldn't have in an operational system. Although I'd be curious for the person who did say that they used it operationally, kind of how they were doing that. So I'm curious. Yeah, and there's a, a question <laughs> here um, related to the um, to the paper that you, you did, and I'll include a link to the paper as well for everybody. Um, can you comment on the use case of metadata management with GraphDBs, which has the highest percentage use as per the poll? Um, yeah, so just to clear, when we did the um, when we did the white paper, um, we just asked, it was more of a binary, are, are you using it or are you not? Um, we'll be doing another one this year, and given the popularity of graph, we may um, ask that question to see why. So the, the feedback we had was just from this group, metadata, so anyone who kind of wants to talk that through um, can talk, but I, I can talk to it in general. So when you think of metadata management, a lot of that is thing related to things. So I want to see, um, and again, it's not just a thing related to thing. I can say here's a piece of information, and metadata is so fluid. Who's the the steward of this? Who what is linked to it in terms of storage? So uh, one of my colleagues actually built their metadata repository. It was on Neo4j, um, and what she liked about it was that she could just. Uh, because metadata, there's so many types of metadata that link to a thing. I have a table. Who is the steward? Who is the owner? What other fields are related to? Where's the documentation? It's not as formal constructs as you may have in a relational, and that could be a pro and con. So some, some metadata repositories have that formal construct. Here's a table, and here's all the columns. Here's all the um, definitions of those columns. There's a place for that. But at its core, sometimes metadata is much more fluid, and these are all of the sort of tag things around it. So in that case, a graph database is very handy that way because you can just sort of add things in a more dynamic way, which as the metadata evolves, that can be very nice. Um, so you don't have, you know, a lot of, there's industry standard meta models, and if you may, my metadata repository, it has kind of data warehouse meta model. Um, but with graph, you can still have, uh, you know, the ontology on there in some structure, but it's a bit more fluid. So. I think that's kind of a neat use case for graph um, because of its flexibility there. So I think we have time for one more question here, Donna. And kind of going back to one of the um, original questions uh, that we, uh, the, the questioner had um, defined it a bit more for us. The use of the total borrower exposure, exposure calculation is based on the relationships of a single individual when he or she wants to borrow money. So that was the original um, post and then, uh, it, total borrower being an individual borrowed in the UK, then in US, then in Iran, and then in Afghanistan, and then Pakistan, et cetera. Should this raise a red flag? Oh, then, then I wasn't familiar with total borrower exposure. Then that sounds like a great um, use case, right? Because it's not just that I have a particular rating, or I can see this too um, and when folks do something like a security clearance, right? Of It's just it's me, but if I'm in debt and I have a relationship to people that may have influence over me or the fact that I do have a relationship or I have a company and that company's gone into bankruptcy and it's all of that. So yeah, that's a great use case to kind of see these patterns, not just the pieces of data you have that I took out this loan with this particular you, you know, organization and I know this limited information is more the connections between it. So yeah, thank you for that clarification because I think from what it sounds like that's a great use case for this type of technology. All right, well that does bring us Hour. There's some additional great questions here, Donna. Maybe I can send them to you and we can get some um, yeah, uh, get some answers for the follow-up. That'd be great. Yeah. So um, thanks, everybody, for being so engaged in everything we do and for all the great questions. And, Donna, thank you for another fantastic presentation. That is all the time we have for today. Again, I will send a follow-up email by end of day Monday with links to the slides, links to the recording of the session, as well as uh, information on uh, with a link to the download the um, 
the white paper or the research paper that Donna was talking about and additional ways you can reach out to Donna. So, and we hope to see you next month in May, as Donna's highlighting there. And I hope everyone has a great day. Thanks so much. Thanks, Donna. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.